Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today to hear the long-term evaluation findings of the Uniting Care Men Choosing Change program. My name is Shay Leggett-Cook and I'm the Principal Advisor for Research and Evaluation within the Family and Disability Services part of Uniting Care. And I'm connecting in today from Turrbal and Jagara country in Mianjin, Brisbane. And I'm delighted to be co-hosting this webinar with our wonderful partners, Professor Annabelle Taylor and Dr. Sue Carswell from the Queensland Centre for Domestic and Family Violence Research, or QCIDFA as it's also known, uh, which sits within CQ University. Now, we do have a really tight program to cover in the next hour. And to help keep us on time, we've decided to limit the audience interaction for the webinar. So your microphones and videos are switched off. And unfortunately, we won't have time to take questions from the audience. However, I do have Elliot Bryan sitting alongside me and he's going to be filtering through information and links into the chat box. So keep an eye on what's coming through there. Uh, we'll move to the acknowledgement in a moment, but I just want to set the scene by giving a bit of background about the project and what's brought us here today. Uh, so really briefly, about six years ago, the Queensland Government released new funding into the men's behaviour change space. And at that time, Uniting Care was able to expand the Men Choosing Change program from two regions into five. So this resulted in us becoming the largest provider of men's behaviour change programs in Queensland. We were aware at this time that there was quite limited evidence about the effectiveness of these programs, and there was especially limited evidence about what works in an Australian context. So we decided to commission an independent evaluation, and we had three aims. Firstly, we wanted to know if our program was contributing to improved safety for women and children by reducing men's use of violence. Secondly, we wanted to know what parts of our practice were working well and what needed to improve. And thirdly, we wanted to share our findings. Uh, we wanted to be transparent and accountable, but we were also hopeful that what we learned would be of use to others working in this space. So our partnership with QSIDFA has been a true collaboration and a shared journey of learning and change. And I think it's safe to say that none of us are the same now. Um, and for me, this way of working in partnership has become the ideal model for how we might harness and build community knowledge about these very complex issues um, that are very difficult to practice in and also quite difficult to research. So let's get underway. Um, at this point, I would like to invite Neil Harwood to deliver the acknowledgement to country. So Neil is a cultural lead here at Uniting Care, and he's been working with our Men Choosing Change program over the last 12 months to improve the cultural appropriateness. Over to you, Neil. Thank you, Shay. Um, as Shay said, my name's Neil Howard and I'm the cultural lead in the FAS area. Um, I want to first apologise because I can't stay for the entire webinar because I'm attending a re rescheduled NADOC event up here in Rockhampton, which was postponed in early July because of heavy rains. Uh, but I do know the webinar has been recorded and I look forward to seeing it as soon as it is available. So I'm a Jaru man from the Kimberleys in Western Australia, and I live on the land of the Durhamwell people up here in Rockhampton. So it's my absolute pleasure to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands represented by people who are attending this webinar today. I also would like to acknowledge the elders of those lands, both past, present and emerging, and to thank them very much for their wisdom and guidance and for their ongoing support to the programs and services we run in their communities every day. I'd also like to acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be in the webinar today. And of course, acknowledge all our non-Indigenous colleagues who do so, so much valuable work in our communities. It's an absolute pleasure to have you all here on the webinar today. One thing I might just point out about the evaluation, which has found a gap, and that's the gap around participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men in these programs. And I think that was identified very early on in the delivery of the program. And I think it's good that we have our eye to this issue because we need to have more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men accessing programs such as 
managed using chains. So I very much look forward to continuing the work to strengthen the men choosing change program. And we should do this by building collaboration and partnerships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, but also Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled organizations who play such a valuable role in our communities every day. So thank you all for having me at this early point in the webinar. I'm very sorry I can't stay longer, but I do wanna uh, thank Shay and the team for inviting me along to do the acknowledgement to country. I really appreciate it. So thank you for having me. Have a good webinar and all the best. Over to you, Shay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Neil. Really appreciate those words. Um, I'd now like to introduce Vivian Bull. Uh, Viv is the General Manager for Family, Child and Individual Support at Uniting Care and the Men Choosing Change program sits within her portfolio. Thanks, Viv. Thanks, Jay. And I come from Ugambe lands today, and I would also like to pay my respect to the elders on the lands that we get to do this important work on. Um, like many of our community partners, Uniting Care is, of course, committed to ending domestic and family violence to women and children in particular. And we understand the complexity of the work and the integral part that each and every one of us plays in doing this work. So um, early intervention programs in particular and programs like Men Choosing Change and other perpetrator change programs are really important to highlight where the issues are and to particularly increase accountability. Um, but we can't do it on our own. So one of the really important things about this work that's been highlighted in the research, but that also sits with our practitioners each and every day is the collegiality and the collaboration that we share with our partners. And I remember when I first joined Uniting Care, um, fairly early days, we partnered with um, Centre Care in the Fraser Coast, where we were providing the men's work and they still provide the um, women's advocacy and the female work and the court support was shared. And the complexities of two large organisations coming together with all of their own policies and procedures and people and personalities and things um, and working through that was really challenging, but also really rewarding. And um, I find with the um, Centre Against Domestic Abuse and Centre Care and our other partners, that the real depth of experience for our participants comes from that shared knowledge and that shared responsibility. So I um, really appreciate the partnerships we have and I really look forward to uh, the findings of the webinar. Thanks, Shay. And now I would like to introduce Professor Annabelle Taylor. Annabelle is a professor for gendered violence uh, at QCIDFA and the chief investigator for the project. Thanks, Annabelle. Um, look, this was a wonderful example for us uh, of partnership uh, with, with an organisation and one uh, which was very willing to, uh, to open its doors, so to speak, uh, across a whole range of personnel and organisational units. I think the co-design process was uh, essential. It was one where uh, we as a team uh, learned so much from what uh, United Care staff uh, and practitioners shared uh, with us. Um, I think really the strength of what followed um, arose out of that initial partnership. Um, I think again that you know another real strength in this project for us has been the flexibility and the willingness of Uniting Care uh, for continuous practice improvement throughout the project, and, and the keenness for staff uh, to learn from uh, you know from our findings in an ongoing sort of way and to uh, adopt and adapt um, accordingly. So um, many thanks, uh, Shay, to. Uh, the research team management to the managers in Uniting Care. Uh, we have very much appreciated working with you. Thank you, Annabelle. Okay, um, we're now going to move to share the long term findings and we'll watch a video um, that has been recorded. Um, before we do so, I'm just going to insert a quick warning here that some people in the audience listening in may find some of the content to be confronting. And if you do find yourself distressed in any way, please do reach out for support. And Elliot has popped some support options into the chat box. So, um, as I said, we're going to play a video on the findings now, and the video has been recorded by Dr. Sue Carswell, who has been part of the project from the beginning and who particularly led the longitudinal um, uh, outcomes evaluation component. Uh, thank you, Faith. We'll see the video now. 
Hello everyone, it's a real pleasure to be presenting the key findings from our longer term evaluation of Uniting Care's program Men Choosing Change. I'd like to start uh, by first thanking the Uniting Care managers, program facilitators, women's advocates and external stakeholders who contributed to this evaluation over three years. We really appreciated your insights, thoughtful feedback and your willingness to support our evaluation in numerous ways. I'd especially like to thank Dr. Shay Leggett-Cook, who has worked collaboratively with us throughout this evaluation in the spirit of true partnership. A very special thank you to the Men Choosing Change participants and their partners and ex-partners who took part in surveys and interviews. You are the reason for this work and your voices are the heart of these findings. I'd also like to acknowledge my colleagues from the Queensland Centre for Domestic and Family Violence Research at Central Queensland University, and in particular, Professor Annabel Taylor. I'd like to uh, start by setting the scene um, of our evaluation findings by outlining the main components of men choosing change. So for men, this involves a 16-week group programme delivered in weekly two-hour sessions which are co-facilitated by female and male facilitators. The program is a psychoeducational program that aims to educate, motivate, and support attitudinal and behavioral changes. It's based on well-established frameworks with a focus on increasing men's understanding of what constitutes domestic and family violence behaviors, how their behaviors affect their partners, ex-partners, and children, and to increase their self-awareness and acceptance for their actions that cause harm. An important element of men's behavior change programs is the employment of a domestic and family violence woman's advocate. Their role is to contact the partners, former partners of program participants to assess risks and needs and provide safety planning supports and referrals to appropriate services for women and children. The advocates liaise with program facilitators to monitor risks and progress. So how do we evaluate this program? We did it in three stages and fundamental to the design and implementation of this evaluation was our collaborative approach with Uniting Care and the use of co-design to develop each stage of the evaluation and sense making to reflect on the findings with stakeholders. In stage one, which began in 2018, we began with co-designing the evaluation framework using program logic and theory of change workshops, which were conducted at each of the evaluation sites with Uniting Care facilitators, advocates and managers, as well as external stakeholders. We also conducted a literature review during this stage. In stage two, which began in 2019, we examined the implementation of Men Choosing Change, which involved interviews with the program facilitators, advocates, managers, and external stakeholders to find out what was working well and areas that required further strengthening. We examined early outcomes for men through comparing surveys they completed before and after finishing the program. We interviewed their partners and ex-partners when men had finished the program to examine their experiences of any changes and how life may have changed for them and their children. In stage three, which was conducted during 2020 and 2021, we examined the longer term outcomes for participants and their partners and former partners and children up to 20 months post program. This included interviews with partners and ex-partners which has been invaluable for obtaining a balanced view of the extent that men choosing change contributed towards men's behavioural changes and is a methodology strongly endorsed by other researchers. In total, 33 men choosing change participants and 19 partners and ex-partners contributed towards stage two and stage three of our evaluation. A limitation is we did not interview children and instead we asked in, uh, men choosing change participants and partners and ex-partners how safe they thought their children felt pre and post program and over the longer term. Further work would have to be conducted with children to hear their views about changes to their safety and well-being. 
So the objectives of our longer term evaluation were to examine the contribution of men choosing change towards participants' changes in attitudes and behaviours over time. And we also wanted to find out what difference the program makes to partners and ex-partners and their children in relation to risk, safety and recovery in the medium to longer term. So the longer term evaluation included in-depth interviews with 10 men and 14 women. And while it's primarily qualitative, we continue to use the survey tools to assess safety and attitudes and behaviours were used in stage two. We also looked at how our findings relate to similar studies in Australia and overseas to consider what this meant in terms of the outcome objectives and for practice. While our interviews with men and women included some couples and ex-couples, we did not report on comparisons of their accounts due to safety concerns. Instead, we reported general findings separately from the samples of men and women. And now I'm going to share with you some of those findings. So first, in regards to safety of women and children, for the safety of women, the women who were current partners felt safer and one ex-partner also felt very safe. The ex-partners rated their safety from somewhat safe, somewhat unsafe to very unsafe. Domestic violence orders were a protective factor for some women as the consequences of breaching an order could keep some men in check, particularly if this resulted in a prison sentence. 11 women had children under 18 years and they rated their children's safety slightly higher than their own and none said they thought that their children felt very unsafe. From the sample of 10 men that we interviewed, all men thought their children would feel very safe with them. Men rated their partners and ex-partners' feelings of safety from somewhat safe to very safe. None of the men thought their partners or ex-partners would feel unsafe or very unsafe. Women and men with parenting arrangements all noted that this could be a source of tension. There was mixed findings regarding the contribution of men choosing change towards longer term outcomes post-programme. With the sample of women, some women identified men choosing change had contributed towards very positive behaviour changes for men, while others identified some or no change. In a few cases, women reported that men used what they had learned in the programme against them. <coughs> Excuse me. Half the women thought the programme was extremely helpful, very helpful or helpful. Three women rated the programme as only a little helpful and four did not think it was helpful at all. Men were more positive about the extent they'd changed and the extent the program had enabled them to do this. They gave many examples of program content and strategies they still used well over a year later to manage their behavior and improve communication. Similar find, the, our findings are similar to the most comprehensive study of longer term outcomes for men's behaviour change programs in Australia conducted by Professor Thea Brown and colleagues. So what are some of the ways that men have changed? Some of the participants told us that they'd gained more of an understanding about the effect of domestic and family violence on children and they particularly found the sessions on children both informative and very emotional, and they would have liked more sessions about children. It also increased their awareness of the range of behaviours and patterns that constitute domestic and family violence, moving beyond thinking it was just physical violence. Women also described these changes. For example, one woman said that her partner recognised that the things he was doing were inappropriate and were domestic violence, which he wouldn't have come to terms with without attending the programme. Part of having a deeper understanding of what domestic and family violence is requires unpacking gender constructs, as well as expectations of gender roles within a relationship. Many of the men reflected on what they had learnt about communication and how they were applying their new communication skills to improve the way they relate to partners and ex-partners and children. Indeed, for some, there seemed to be a ripple out effect as their improved self-awareness, emotional regulation, communication skills, and openness had improved their broader relationships with family, 
friends and work colleagues. Many of the men in our study saw themselves on a journey of change and men choosing change have provided them with a good starting point on an ongoing process of self-development. A few men said that the program reinforced the path that they were already on. Motivation and engagement in the program are a, a fundamental starting point for change. And our interviews with many of the men and partners and ex-partners confirmed that the reasons when men went into the program were externally motivated for most men, whether mandated or non-mandated to go to men choosing change, such as hopes of reconciling with a partner and or lifting or reducing the conditions of a DVO. Where children were involved, men were motivated to attend the program to gain access to their children. Other studies have also found this, such as O'Leary and Young's study in 2020. What is evident from our study and others is that when most men enter a men's behaviour change program, they're externally motivated, and it takes time to internalise these motivations and accept responsibility for behaviour. The mixed findings of our longer-term study show that men were at various stages of this journey. Our findings indicate that men choosing change can act as a catalyst to change when men find content relevant to their situation. And this is reinforced by other men in the group where they are able to practice new strategies and gain confidence and normalize changes. Indeed, many men interviewed for stage three were very positive about the groups they attended and benefited in important ways from the group process, which they found inspiring, affirming and a safe space to open up and learn. So this quote is from a participant who describes his continuous process of learning and practicing throughout the program. He reflected that it was not just one thing he learned, rather it was taking what was relevant from each session and applying it and taking it on board. This incremental process of change aligns with the findings from other studies, such as Kelly and Westmoreland's UK study Project Maribel which found the men's, that men's change requires layers of new understandings, reflection and translation into behaviour. Our evaluation findings also highlight that men's behaviour change programmes are generally not long enough to change entrenched behaviours and ongoing work is required. Men may require supports from a range of services to address specific issues, for example, therapeutic counselling, mental health issues and addiction issues. Some of the men and women we interviewed identified the importance of non-service supports from family, friends and work colleagues to encourage and sustain changes. This was often facilitated by skills they'd learned at Men Choosing Change. Other studies such as Rodney Vallee's work found the development of pro-social networks that are non-violent is important for normalising and supporting longer term So in summary, um, the program related factors identified as enabling men's positive behavior change included engaging and motivating men to change attitudes and behaviors, which requires skilled um, facilitators to work with men and facilitate group dynamics so that men are supporting each other to make positive changes. Engagement with the program is enhanced when content that men with content that men find relevant to their situation, for example, positive fathering content. Increasing men's knowledge about what domestic and family violence is and its impact on partners and ex-partners and children and encouraging their sense of empathy. Increasing their understanding about themselves, why they act in certain ways and to develop more self-awareness and providing men with the skills, tools, and strategies to enable behavior changes. For some of the women we interviewed, the contact with the woman's advocate was the first time that contact that had connected with a domestic and family violence service and as an opportunity to provide safety supports. Generally, women found the advocate very helpful, but where women stated they did not, this was mainly due to wanting more contact and support. 
our findings strongly support expanding the capacity of the advocate role to increase their ability to monitor risk and provide women and children with supports to improve their safety and recovery. This is supported by other Australian studies, such as the ANROSE report by Don Donna Chung and colleagues. There are, there are also opportunities to increase children's safety and wellbeing through more child-focused content in Men Choosing Change and through the role of the woman's advocate to assess children's risks and needs and refer to appropriate services. Family law issues were raised frequently by those we interviewed, both men and women. This highlights the importance of Uniting Care's relationship with other agencies, such as child safety and family law services, and having a collaborative focus on children. In regard to supporting women's longer term recovery from their experiences of domestic and family violence, we identified noted gaps in finding suitable supports as most DfE services focus on crisis responses. This gap in service delivery was identified by the Queensland Government's Special Task Force on Domestic and Family Violence. So in 2019, the Queensland Government began funding organisations to provide the women's health and wellbeing support services to provide recovery services for survivors of gender-based violence. An evaluation of these services found extremely high demand from women, highlighting the need for increased capacity in longer term recovery services. So I'd just like to finish by um, giving you a, a brief summary of our, some of our key findings. So Men Choosing Change has acted as a catalyst for changing domestic and family violence behaviours for some men. Many of the men in our study saw themselves on a journey of change, and this is an incremental process that takes time given the entrenched attitudes and behaviours. The mixed findings of our longer term study show that men were at various stages of this journey. Enablers of change include men's engagement and motivation, which was facilitated by skilled program facilitators, and when men found program content relevant to their situation. This was reinforced by other men in the group where they were able to practice new strategies and gain confidence and normalise changes. We also found that it was important to have realistic expectations of what a men's behaviour change programme can achieve. And this has also been um, found by numerous other studies. The findings make clear that men's behaviour change programmes are only part of the solution and, and they need to be firmly situated within a broader system response that includes a range of services as well as community supports for men, women and children. Integrated response systems endeavour to improve coordination and collaboration between agencies. However, many of the integrated response systems concentrate resources on crisis and the work of prevention, early intervention and longer term recovery require more focus. We also ident identified the need to strengthen the woman's advocate role to increase the ability of the program to monitor risk and provide women and children with supports to improve their safety and recovery. There are also opportunities to increase children's safety and wellbeing through more child-focused content and men choosing change and the role of the women's advocate to assess children's risks and needs and refer to appropriate services. Uniting Care have committed to translating what they've learned from the evaluation into practice. And Shay is going to tell you more about that in the next presentation. Uh, thank you to Sue um, for sharing those findings. Um, I just wanted to remind people um, that this was a study that ran over several years and it's quite challenging um, with so much rich detail and rich information um, to really pull out those key findings. Um, but the, the two reports associated with this, with this evaluation are on our website and um, Elliot has put the links into chat. So please feel free to download them and read more for yourself. Um, so I'm uh, going to play uh, a slideshow now. So if you could just bear with me while I get that set up.
Okay, hopefully that's displaying correctly. Um, okay, so I'm just going to start by noting that Uniting Care isn't funded to do research. So undertaking a project like this was a really big commitment for us as an organisation. Um, and this has prompted us to be really intentional about how we use the findings and try to improve what we do. And so today I'm just going to talk for a few minutes to tell you about what we've tried to do and some things we've learned along the way. So uh, firstly, um, in community services, we always talk about the importance of being evidence-based, um, but I think it's something that's really easy to say and not so easy to do. Um, I think there's an assumption that researchers will simply produce knowledge and that it will somehow trickle down and be picked up and applied by end users. Uh, but there was a review uh, published by Anrose in 2015 that found a consistent failure to adopt and effectively implement research into practice and policy right across the community services. And it's not limited to community services. And there have been multiple uh, studies in healthcare settings that have shown it takes on average 17 years for research evidence to find its way into meaningful change in clinical practice. So that's a really long time to be caught uh, within what's also known as the no-do gap. And part of the challenge is that we still don't know a lot about how to do knowledge translation well, let alone how we could do it faster. Um, but when we're talking about a serious problem like domestic and family violence, I think it's really clear that we need to be doing better than we are. And by we, I don't just mean that researchers need to do more to translate their work. I'm also talking about community services and government we need to be asking for knowledge translation to be part of any research that we're involved with. And we also need to understand that we have a role in shaping that process and making sure that it's relevant for us. So my key message here is that knowledge translation is critical for obtaining benefit from research, but it probably won't happen without a specific focus and clear strategies. So for us, um, when the first report of this evaluation was released last year, uh, we trialled a process to bring together the evaluation team with our staff to look at what the findings would mean for our program. So there were two ideas that we thought were really important to this process. Firstly, uh, we wanted it to be interactive. So rather than sending out written material to everyone, we wanted to bring everyone together to talk and reflect together. Um, secondly, we wanted to include all of our practitioners in that process, um, not just our managers, so that whatever decisions we made were informed by the experiences of those working directly with our clients. So we developed a series of online workshops uh, because it had to be online because this was last year and there were still tr uh, COVID travel restrictions in place. Um, but the workshops were designed to move everyone through a process of first hearing and reflecting on the findings then generating a wish list for change. And by the time we reached the last workshop, we had narrowed that list down to seven priority areas for improvement. And there were things like improving our focus on children and looking at how we could um, uh, respond to diversity more strongly. So we identified practical actions for each of the areas. And the, these range from what we called quick wins that could be achieved with our current resources um, through to longer term strategies like workforce investment and expanding our partnerships. So since then, we've achieved some of our small actions and one of our big ones. Um, we're actually piloting a new program at the moment, a behaviour maintenance program called Men Sustaining Change. And we've still got a lot to achieve, but essentially, um, I think it's important that we've started that process of building our capacity as a provider to respond to evidence. So my key message here is that for service providers, knowledge translation can be encouraged by involving all staff and linking evidence to continuous improvement. And when it comes to sharing knowledge externally, um, as I said, we've put our reports on the website, um, we've presented at three conferences so far, and we're working on a journal article uh, with QSIDBA. And I think these are the sorts of traditional research outputs that will always be important for communicating findings, but they're still very much in that vein of releasing information and hoping that it will be picked up and used. So in reflecting on how we can be more impactful with our external knowledge transfer, um, again, we found the ANROS review to be really instructive because it um, highlighted evidence that strategies that facilitate interaction between different audiences were more effective. 
Uh, so this webinar is our attempt to contribute to and elevate conversations that are already happening in our sector about the role of men's behaviour change programs in our community response to DV. And we're also hoping that it will contribute to conversations about how the delivery of these programs could be enhanced in Queensland. So in the next part of the webinar, we've invited several stakeholders um, to be part of a panel discussion to consider the implications for Queensland. And alongside this, we've been thinking about advocacy and um, we hope that some of you in the audience might be thinking about this too. And we'd love to hear from you if uh, you are. Elliot will be putting our contact details into chat. So now I'd like to hand over to Professor Annabelle Taylor to introduce our panel. All right, we're all back. Great. Thank you, Shay, for that uh, summary. I'd really uh, like to welcome our panelists today and thank you all so much for participating. Uh, we're really looking forward to your input. With us today, we have Holly Brennan and Carly Grant from CADA, the Centre Against Domestic Abuse in Caboolture. We have Paul Monsour from Anglicare and SPEAK, the National Peak Body for Men's Behaviour Change Programs in Queensland. Uh, and Paul has many years of experience in working with men. And Leanne Downs from the Department of Children, Youth Justice and Multicultural Affairs, who has worked in child protection for many years. Welcome again to you all. So I'm going to ask a question uh, of each of the panelists to respond to individually. Uh, and from their perspectives. There may be some time for some shared discussion or an additional question at the end. We'll see how we go. So to begin with, um, Holly and Carly, and I'm not sure whether you'd like to uh, you know, share the response here. Um, and I'm very open to whichever way you'd like to do this. But the first question that I'm going to ask you to consider uh, what evaluation findings stood out for you from your perspective, from your areas of practice and policy uh, that you operate in? I'm, I'm happy to speak to that first, if that's okay, Holly. Um, thank you, Annabelle. Um, I think what really stood out um, for me as a women's advocate was um, the support or the um, lack thereof of support that some of the women um, or feeling under supported um, who were who participated in the study. Um, it's I, I guess it's part of it because um, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about their safety and, you know, meeting those practice standards about making sure that, um, you know, their, their safety is our overarching practice. But um, also, I guess that speaks to my own frustration as a practitioner of how limited um, our resources are to be able to follow through and um, follow up and um, have the opportunity to continue to support people through this journey. Mm. So, I mean, if I can just say, you know, um, Carly's our practitioner and I'm the CEO of, of the service. So, you know, I spend a lot of time looking at resources. I don't find um, the evaluation, um, it, I think it's it's quite obvious, um, the outcomes that have come from it, that, that there are those restraints. You know, Carly can only work two days a week uh, with uh with clients, with, with the women that she supports. And she can sometimes have, you know, 60 to 70 people on her books. And these people are at great risk. Um, and then, you know, part of the report talks about the importance Ooh. of um, women's wellbeing projects or also children and young people services. Now at CADA, we're incredibly lucky. We have a women's wellbeing hub and we have a children and young people's program. At the moment, we've got 308 women waiting on our therapeutic recovery list. So I think all of the findings are, are what we expect. We know what we have to do and we all believe in helping um, you know, men recover and, and go on their journey. But at the same time, if we don't have someone like Carly with eyes on the women and children, um, it, it's just a huge risk for all of us. Thanks, Holly. Um, you've both raised you know, quite a number of uh, issues here uh, you know, that have arisen, if you like, out of out of the study, and our particular feature of this area of service and practice. Uh, Paul, moving to you, um, what, what in the evaluation findings stood out for you, Paul, uh, from the Men's Behaviour Change Program perspective? 
Thanks, Annabelle. The, the first thing is just how familiar the findings are. Um, having been having conversations with uh, practitioners and services across Queensland for quite a number of years, these are the same issues that we've been talking about for a long time. Um, issues in terms of the gaps and the, and the problems, but also issues in terms of what works and what the men report as, as helpful. Um, so I think that gives us some confidence that what you've captured here in this research is actually representative of more than just what happens at UCC, but across the sector in Queensland. Um, one of the things that stood out for me is about the diversity of outcomes. So that's, that's, that's one of the familiar things. And it's identified as being to do with where men are at in their journey of change, with the stages of change. Um, and that's certainly part of it. And the other part of it, I think, is that men present with different kinds of issues in relation to why they are using or continuing to use domestic and family violence. So the work looks different. What matters for each man is, is different. Uh, and the ability to, so that leads on to the, the question of how do we address that, which is tailoring our interventions. Um, the report refers to the need to connect with other services, drug and alcohol services, could be therapeutic services, certainly in terms of men who've experienced serious abuse in the past, we have um, we don't have the capacity to, to fully address that. Um, but it can be very intimately tied to men's propensity to use violence in their uh, in their relationships. Um, but there's another level too, apart from going outside the program itself for that support is the capacity to actually do individual sessions alongside the group. And I notice that you've identified that as well. And that ties in really strongly with my experience as a practitioner that it's, I think it's really good bang for the buck to actually be able to spend even one or two individual sessions after having spent a number of weeks uh, with a man in a group, because by then we've developed a much more nuanced understanding of what, what's going on for him and what's gonna make the difference. So that the individual work we do can be really targeted and, and really tailored to what, what's gonna make a change for him. Um, final comment uh, is about the need to support post group and that this needs to be <clears throat> a community response. I think we need to find out a lot more about how we can engage other kinds of things that men are, uh, are uh, involved with in the community in both preventing and uh, preventing change and supporting the systems. We'll stop there. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, that's great. All right, so moving to um, Leanne, and um, Leanne, you've had extensive experience in working with children and uh, you know with very a range of services. I'm aware of your caring with dad's role. Um, what are your thoughts on this question? So which findings stood out for you? Yeah. Just unmuting. Thank you. <laughs> so look, I guess very similar to what's already been said um, in that the, the same, it, same issues were identified it's sort of been ongoing issues for a period of time and I was really interested in that you know men rated their children's feelings as being very safe so that was uh, I, that was interesting to me when you know and I guess we're we we know from experience that their children would report something very very different here so I guess you know what I was um, it, it, there was certainly the need to suggests that there is a lot more opportunities to increase children's safely, safety through more child focused content. So really having that opportunity to bring the children's voices, you know, into some of that content that's happening to, uh, that's going on to increase their motivation and, and increase their, their want to engage in a program. And we, knew, we know that um, motivation is a fundamental starting point. So upon the starting point to the program that men are more likely we, we know that they're more likely externally motivated and it, they were at various stages of the journey towards accepting responsibility. Whereas when children were involved, the external motivation was more around gaining access to their children. So I guess more around, you know, wanting to meet their own needs and that it takes time to internalize these motivations and accept responsibility for their behavior. So, you know, how do we support them to recognize the needs for their children to be need them to be a safe parent 
and certainly endorsing what um, what Paul was stating there is that there is you know, certainly a need to do some individual sessions. I sometimes wonder whether those individual sessions could be done prior to attending behaviour change programs to really increase that or move that in external motivation to internal motivation. What also stood out for me absolutely was the need to strengthen the role of the DV advocate to enhance children and women's safety and also the recovery from the the recovery from uh, the abuse and the damage to the relationship between the woman and the child. So really uh, an opportunity there to increase their capacity to enable a lot more contact with children and women. And the, the third thing that really stood out was that um, the opportunity to strengthen the relationships in a really in a more collaborative focus, particularly through child safety and family court. So uh, for example, where the, it's identified that upon completion of a program, um, a father was still remaining completely externally motivated and wasn't able to shift to any internal motivations. How do we share some of that information to continue to assess risk? So that were the things that um, continued to, that stood out for me. Thanks, Ken. Um, you've all given some very uh, interesting insights. Um, I'm going to move now to our next question for you. And this relates to how the findings may be applied within the Queensland domestic and family violence sector from your perspective. So this is moving towards shifts uh, in practice. Some of you have dealt with this uh, somewhat already, but you might have some other uh, issues here uh, in terms of, of how the findings might be applied. So perhaps if we, if we start with you again, uh, Carly, would you like to, to bounce us off? Sure, absolutely. Um... Yeah, look, I'm in 100% agreement with um, Leanne around building those relationships, um, the work that could be done uh, how, if we had the resources to be able to. Um, I believe that um, for that kind of that wraparound um, safety, those conversations, that um, continued risk assessment, um, that the relationships that we can build with these larger systems um, really helps. Um, it's those additional sets of eyes on the family for this very short period of time that we have working with them um, that can work really well. So I know from my own um, perspective, when, you know, we I have identified some of those highest risk cases that I, um, I've been referred, um, that the time that I prioritise to build a relationship with the um, child safety officer or um, if I have an opportunity to speak with a parole officer or advocacy um, with like police prosecutions team or I've, I've even had conversations with the DPP. So when those things happen, when there's that opportunity to be able to have like more transparent info sharing, um, you know, for these, particularly for these higher risk cases, um, that yeah, it's that real wraparound approach that we get to, um, you know, uh, I guess, identify what some of those more, um, those risks are that might not be quite so obvious on the surface, but when we kind of map out his behaviour and, and, you know, the work that's already being done by um, additional agencies, one, we're not doubling up on the work um, and we're being efficient, um, but two, yeah, we're really identifying what her strengths are and what's still um, needed um, for her safety and for the children's safety. Right. right. Uh, thanks, Carly. Um, we're rapidly running out of time, folks. So I'm going to ask you to uh, you know, to move along uh, quickly. Um, perhaps if I could quickly move to Paul uh, for a response to this. Oh, um, funding. Is anyone from government here? I'm, I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear people want to talk about funding. Um, and obviously, uh, advocacy is a key one, but I also want to talk about the, the value of flexibility in the funding models. Um, that business of being able to tailor our interventions um, and being able to offer individual sessions is one example of that, because some funding agreements don't allow that. And that's a simple change that's not going to cost dollars. Um, there has been an, a high, a highlighted the, the need uh, for uh, increased support for children as well as women. We have, we still in Queensland use the term women's advocate generally. Um, uh, in other states, there's the term family safety contact worker. Victoria certainly uses that. 
Uh, and we had this discussion earlier, um, maybe we need to put, if we're going to change it, a specialist family safety contact worker to identify that this is a role that actually has some very unique features compared to other advocacy roles. Um, but in terms of the, of the diversity of relationships and population that we're serving, I think there's some value in thinking about our language for that. And also including with that a conversation with government about expanding the role. Right. Right. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to have to quickly move. So, Leanne, have you got some last thoughts in regard to this uh, this issue about the impact, um, how these mm. findings go? Look, I guess for me, the sooner a father or father figure can genuinely develop internal motivation to change his behaviour, the greater the likelihood of increasing safety for children and mothers will occur. So by supporting them to develop more empathy, more self-awareness, better understand the impacts of their behaviours on the children, um, this can also support their journey towards holding themselves responsible as a father or father figure, as a parent responsible to change their own behaviour and so how we as a, a service sector can all be having those sorts of conversations with fathers and father figures around how their behaviours are impacting and showing up in the lives of their children and having a long-term impact. Um, I've probably got a huge amount I'd like to talk about but I'm very aware that you've pushed for time Annabelle. No, thank you, yeah that's great. Holly have you got, probably got time for just the last quick yeah, I mean, I think the thing that I want to go back to is the complexity of the practice that everybody has just spoken about. So, you know, this has huge three theoretical frameworks around it. And my nervousness in our, our desire to do this work with men and, and young people around violence is that we forget that we need specialists to be able to be part of that and work together. And mm -hmm. so I really can't say, you know, strongly enough that we need to have specialist DV services and specialist informed men's programs that have a DV lens or children's programs with a DV lens or we'll miss the mark anyway. Yes, indeed. And as an evaluator, what struck me uh, uh, frequently was the amount of time that practice personnel had to spend in actually creating relationships. You know, those working relationships across boards between government, between other organisations. So um, that, that excellent. So um, one of the other uh, questions that I had for you was in regard to the way in which the evaluation impacted uh, immediately or in the medium term in terms of your frontline practice were there any ways in which during the evaluation you found you needed to I, I guess this question is particularly pertinent uh, to Carly and, uh, and Holly um, would you like to to uh, share some thoughts in regard to that So, sorry, Annabelle let me just clarify um, you were wanting to know like how our my practice is affected by the limitations that were found and discovered in the report? Yes, and okay. as, yes, and indeed as the evaluation continued, there were learnings that were feeding it, uh, you know, to the services. And so it's about, you know, this uh, process of change uh, as part of the evaluation itself. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I think that, that, really like as we progressed we were able to um, understand what some of those limitations looked like we had to do a lot of refining our own processes um, working along with um, men choosing change team the facilitators how we communicated and it was like this constant process of kind of streamlining um, triaging um, having to kind of identify what those highest risk cases were and as a result I think what's ended up happening um, because one of our um, the manager of Men Choosing Change for Morton now sits um, as a member on our high risk team so what happened what's happened is that a lot I would say at least half of the referrals I'm receiving now are um, cases that have been stepped down from our high risk team which is our um, you know identified cases within the region with the highest risk of lethality so I guess that means like it's it's also increased our responsibility of being able to kind of hold um, that space for these people while they're continuing from some really, you know, um, impactful um, situations. Um, and then 
yeah, like where, what to next? You, you know, so I, I feel myself kind of often going above and beyond, you know, the parameters of the, um, of my role and the program um, because there is simply nowhere else for these people to go after this 16 week period is, is completed. So yeah, that, I guess that's what we've adapted over time and um, yeah, I mean, it still speaks to the limitations of the program, but yeah, how we've been able to adapt it due to the findings. I know we're running out of time, but can I just say thank you for doing this kind of research and trying to make it accessible for all of us? Because I think it really highlights that this is a team approach. Whereas if, if you talk to mainstream people or to funders, they think that it's about men's programs and they don't realise that actually we're all working together to keep on eyes on people, to keep them safe. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that that's the power um, for, for us as advocates as well, that this really neatly and quickly shows what a team approach it is. Thank you. Sorry, just really quickly, I just wanted to add that as a result of this process as well, as you know, through child safety and through our um, our collaboration with United Care, like one of the, what we've been able to do is, is have some of our, um, our officers sit in what we call intake meetings and closure meetings within the Men Choosing Change program in some of our regions. And the benefit of that in terms of supporting right from that very start, the development of internal motivation. So we're actually here to talk about your kids. This is why you're doing this. This is you know, how the behaviours are impacting your kids. And then at the end of that, at the closure meetings after the 16 weeks also attending so that we within child safety can develop a bit of a report to say, well, yes, there was some internal motivation for change indicated by this, this and this, or no, no apparent um, internal motivation for change remains external, really worried that this is going to be used for family court. We put that information on our systems, the documentation's there, when our information's subpoenaed, it better supports the family court process. So really being able to develop a much more collaborative, responsive approach um, to, to some of those fathers who might be, you know, utilising the system for their own benefit but also support those fathers who are genuinely using the program and genuinely taking something from it. So it helps us to determine risk in the child safety space and to support the family court space to determine risk around you know, where children should be placed. That's great. Thank you, Leanne. That's a very nice closing to this um, session, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, of the changes that, you know, that can occur. Uh, so thank you all. I'll pass on to Shane. Uh, thanks, Annabelle. And um, just in wrapping up now, I just wanted to pick up on Holly's words before and just say um, just that I really support what you've said, Holly. I think all of us who work in this sector, providers, researchers, government, um, elders, community leaders, those with lived experience, we know that we're stronger when we work together. And I just want to thank all of our speakers here today for demonstrating the spirit of that commitment so beautifully. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Elliot, Brian, Faith Jarvis and Lauren Barrett here at Uniting Care for being such a fantastic support crew to all of us in preparing this webinar and keeping us on track today. Uh, just a quick reminder that we will be recording or we have recorded the webinar and we'll be sending it out to everyone who registered. So please feel free to send that on through your networks. Um, and as I said before, if anyone would like to get in touch with us after the webinar, um, we would really love to hear from you. So thank you for attending today and I hope that you all have a great weekend. Bye now.